Welcome back to the epilogue for season one of Theory of Flight. In this epilogue, I just want to clear up a couple of points or make a couple of final points for the season. And the first is what physicists call the frame of reference question. I'd like to take you back to episode one. We talked about what I call the standard explanation of how a wing produces lift. Out on the internet, you find a lot of animations that show the standard explanation of how a wing produces lift. Here's a typical one. Now, I created this one uh, so that I could fool around with it a little bit, but this is typical of what you find on the internet. And here we have two parcels of air approaching a wing and they split at the leading edge. The lower parcel travels along the bottom of the wing unaffected and the upper one travels around the curved surface over the top of the wing. And the claim is that you can actually see the acceleration of the air as it travels over the top of the wing. Now, certainly, it, it kind of does look like it's accelerating, doesn't it, as you watch it over and over again there. There is the air accelerating over the top of the wing. So a little trick that you can use is to change the frame of reference. But first, what do we mean by frame of reference? In this case, the frame of reference is the wing itself. It's as though the wing is not moving and the air is traveling past the wing. So it's the, the view that you might say that you would have as a passenger of an airplane. You're moving along with the wing. So from your point of view or frame of reference, the air is in motion. And so we are seeing here two parcels of air moving. But what if we freeze it right there? And now we're going to change the frame of reference. Now, an equally good way of looking at this is to say that the truth is that the air itself is not moving. In the Newtonian image of, uh, of air, which is clearly what's uh, lying behind this animation, the air is not moving. It's the wing that moves. So what we're going to do is hold the lower air parcel stationary. So it now becomes the frame of reference. And we'll examine how the wing and the upper air parcel move relative to the lower one. Now, before I show you this, I want to make the point that physicists figured out a long time ago, in fact, Newton figured this out himself, that the frame of reference doesn't matter. All that matters is that you pick a frame of reference. And once you've picked it, you've got to stick with it. You can't go chopping and changing. Uh, physics is all about measuring distances and time and changes, velocities and so on. And they're all measured relative to a frame of reference. Once you've chosen that frame of reference, just stick with it. And you should get the same result in terms of Newtonian physics as if you picked any other frame of reference. So we're, there was nothing wrong with the previous frame of reference, and we're perfectly entitled to pick a different frame of reference, so that's what we're going to do. Sometimes, though, a frame of reference change makes things a little clearer. Now watch if we now start the wing moving past these two parcels of air. Here comes the wing, and oh, oh wait a minute. Back that up again. I want to see that again. Okay, let's see that again. You see what's actually going on here? Yeah, it's true that the upper parcel of air is accelerating, but it's being accelerated vertically. When you think about it for just a minute, as soon as the people said that the two parcels of air have to reach the trailing edge at the same time, there couldn't possibly be any acceleration in the horizontal. All the acceleration had to be in the vertical. So as I keep the wing going back and forth here, just so you can see what's going on, you know what this reminds me of? It reminds me of a camshaft. It's like the wing is a lobe on a camshaft. And that upper parcel of air is like a push rod. And the wing comes along and pushes it up. And then it comes back down. Of course, if you know anything about engines, you know that the push rod comes back down on the back side of the lobe of a camshaft because there is a spring that pushes it down. So we do seem to have a little bit of a problem. There's no explanation for why the air comes back down the backside of the wing. 
Maybe it's gravity. That would mean you can't fly inverted. You know, that can't be right. There's got to be some explanation. But in any case, what you can see here is that as the camshaft, I mean the wing, moves between the two parcels of air, it lifts up the parcel of air uh, above it. And in order to do that, it has to apply a force upwards, which means the air is going to apply a force downwards, which means that this animation is perfect if you want to prove that airplanes are never going to get off the ground. Because that's what this animation proves, that flight is impossible. So hopefully in this final recap, you now know what actually happens, of course. What really happens is, first of all, there are no two parcels of air. If we could imagine two parcels of air out here in front of the wing, they say, hi, nice to see you. Where are you off to? I don't know, but I'm going there at 600 knots. And so they're going off in different directions, and there's no chance that they're going to meet up again at the trailing edge. The kinetic theory of gas just completely lays to waste the whole underlying notion of air particles splitting, traveling around the wing, and joining up again at the trailing edge. That's not even remotely close to what's going on. However, there is, as we learned, a pressure field that forms around the nose of the airplane that causes an airflow. Airflow doesn't mean what the average person on the street thinks it means, but now with your more sophisticated understanding of pressure, you know what the scientists are really trying to tell us when they say that the air accelerates around the top of a wing. And so hopefully you can put this all together. Now, that's enough of that. This is a good segue into the final point, which you may remember in the last episode I said I was going to talk about Newton's third law. So first of all, if Newton was here, he'd say, third law? I have a third law? I don't remember three laws. The actual truth is Newton only gave us two laws. Then he gave us a principle. The principle is known as the principle of equal but opposite reaction. It says that if you apply a force to one object, say this book, for example, which is all about Newton's third law, if I apply a force to it with my hand, I push up on the book with my hand, the book pushes down on my hand. It's inescapable. The book pushes on me, I push on it, the two forces are equal but opposite. Strictly speaking, this is not a theory. This is actually derived from the theory. The theory being Newton's first law and the second law, and the observation that Newton made about the way forces are created. He noticed that most forces are created through impact, and certain other forces, gravitational force, which he explained, it's uh, built right into the theory that every object attra attracts every other object. So, uh, it's true that the Earth is pulling me down towards it, but it's equally true that I'm pulling the Earth up towards me. So anyway, if I take the book and I drop it, it of course falls until it encounters something else that's going to support it. The table in this case. So now the book is pushing down on the table, but the table is pushing up on the book. If I ask you what is holding the book up, I suspect that your intuitive answer is the table. You're not going to say the book is being held up by its downward force. That would be a little bit of an odd thing to say. And yet, it's actually true that the table can't hold the book up unless the book first pushes down on the table. They're inextric inextricably intertwined, these two concepts. Now, the important question because really this comes up in the context of, is it true that an airplane must deflect the air as the airplane flies through the air? That's the crux of the question we're trying to get at. And so is it true that the book must deflect the table? If I take my tape measure here, and I take the, the book off the table, and I measure the table, and then I put my book on the table, and I say, no, it didn't go down. Well, we know that's not fair, right? This is just way too crude of an instrument. 
if I was to go get myself sophisticated enough measuring devices, and they'd have to be pretty darn sophisticated, we have to believe, according to Newton's laws, that when that book rests on the table, it deflects that table downwards. Similarly, I'm standing on a concrete floor, and my weight is bearing down on the floor, and so there's going to be this slight depression in the concrete floor where I'm standing. Now, fat as I am, it's not very obvious that there's a depression there. You'd have to have some pretty fancy equipment to measure that depression. But that's what Newton's principle of equal but opposite reactions demands. The, the floor can't push up on me unless I push down on it. If I push down on it, I have to make a depression in the floor. Now, I'd like to take you on a little bit of a field trip to explore this a little bit more deeply. So, let's go for a ride in my car. So I'm taking you out to a place I know that's just perfect to demonstrate Newton's principle of equal but opposite reaction. But I thought maybe on the way we should just talk a little bit about how Newton's principle applies to a car. Because remember, one of the, the points that I've tried to emphasize throughout this season is that the laws of physics are universal. The way a car is supported is exactly the same way an airplane is supported or anything else for that matter. So the tires on my car are inflated to about 35 psi. But in aviation we tend to talk about the wing loading of our airplanes, usually in units of pounds per square foot rather than pounds per square inch. So 35 psi, that's 5,000 pounds per square foot. An airplane with a wing loading of 5,000 pounds per square foot would never get off the ground. Light aircraft that we use in flight training uh, always have wing loadings of less than 20 pounds per square foot. And even the heaviest airliners are in the neighborhood of 150. So at 5,000, a car's wing loading, tire loading, is huge in comparison to an airplane. So as I drive the car down the road here, the question is, is the car deflecting the road? And once again, it would be very difficult to see the depression in the road as the car drives by. But it really is making a depression in the road. It is deflecting the road down, so the car is constantly driving back up out of the, uh, the slight depression that it's creating for itself as you drive along the road. Just something to keep in mind. Okay, we're getting close here to our turns. Just coming up here in a couple of seconds and I'll show you the spot I have in mind. So, this is the point I wanted to bring you to. And the reason is right behind me, this sand hill. It's a great place to make the point about Newton's principle of equal but opposite reaction. What I'm going to do is scramble up the hill, and you'll see that as I go up the hill, the sand rolls down the hill. So come on, let's give it a try. Well, you can certainly see that the sand is rolling down the hill. In fact, as I continue up the hill, the sand will just keep rolling down more and more and more. There's really no way, as you can see, for me to get enough purchase here to climb up the hill without making some sand roll down the hill. Now, that's the same as an airplane traveling through the air. There's no way that an air, that the air can push up on an airplane without the airplane pushing down on the air. And air 
is a lot more like sand than it is like the highway. So my car didn't really deflect the highway very significantly, but my body is heavy enough to deflect the sand because the sand is not substantial enough to support me. If this was a granite cliff, I'd be able to climb up it without noticeably deflecting it. We all know that it would deflect, but such a small amount that you wouldn't be able to see it with the naked eye. But sand, we can easily see it being disturbed when we walk through it. And it's the same way with air. When an airplane flies through the air, we say that the airplane deflects the air, and that's certainly true. Newton's principle of equal and opposite reaction says there's always going to be a deflection of the two objects involved in a collision. It's just that in the case of an airplane and an air, it's a very noticeable deflection. In the case of a car on a road, it really isn't. So hopefully that gave you a little bit of clarity on the Newton's principle of equal but opposite reaction. The important thing to realize when you're thinking about this principle is that there's always two objects involved anytime there's a force. For example, there's the book and the table. There's the airplane and the air, the car and the road. If there's only one object, it can't apply a force. It has to apply a force to something. So, uh, for example, a propeller. It provides the thrust force by pushing the air back. As it pushes the air back, the air pushes the propeller forward, bringing the airplane along with it. That's simply how it works. Now, given that there have to be two objects any time there's a force, the amount of deflection is really just uh, a contingent fact of the nature of those objects. A car pushing down on the road, even though the car has uh, a wheel loading, of 5,000 pounds per square foot, it barely deflects the road at all. On the other hand, a light aircraft, even though it has a wing loading of only 15 pounds per square foot, it deflects the air fairly substantially. The reason? Well, it's the same as why I deflect sand quite a lot and granite very little. It's just simply the way it is. Uh, now, you can, you can uh, talk about lift being the result of deflecting the air if you want, uh, in the same way that you can say that the, the lift is the result of deflecting the table or the support of your car is the result of deflecting the road. One of the principles that I've tried to emphasize is that you need to universalize your thinking. If you want to talk about an airplane being supported by deflecting the air, then you need to commit yourself to using that explanation in everything and universalizing it. Most people are unwilling to do that. So in other words, they, they tend to be very ad hoc about uh, their use of Newton's third law or the principle of equal and opposite reactions. And to me, that's not good thinking. It's a, it's a flaw in, in terms of critical thinking theory. Uh, so I would resist it if I was you. Certainly you need to acknowledge the fact that there's always a deflection of the object. When you apply force to something, the other object is always deflected. Uh, in the case of air, fairly common sense that it's deflected quite a bit. Uh, if we reduce the wing loading more and more and more, the air would be deflected less and less and less, and eventually if you keep Reducing the wing loading, you know what you wind up with? A hot air balloon. And at that point, the hot air balloon can float in the air without deflecting it at all. So hopefully this has clarified the issue of uh, Newton's principle of equal but opposite reaction. Possibly it just muddied the water a little bit. But anyway, it's given you something to think about. Um, so this really is it now for season one of Theory of Flight. So I'm looking forward to seeing you again next season when we're going to talk about pitch control. But until then, I'm Ray Preston, and this is Theory of Flight.